Who believes what we've heard and seen? Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this? The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him, and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, <clears throat> it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we got healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way, and God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him. On him. He was beaten, he was tortured, but he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to be slaughtered and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried and he was let off. And did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare, beaten bloody for the sins of my people, they buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with a rich man, even though he had never hurt a soul or said one word that wasn't true. Still, this is what God had in mind all along, to crush him with pain. The plan was that he give himself as an offering for sin so that he'd see life come from it. Life and more life. This is a, a quote that talks about a man who suffered, who was kind of looked over, passed over. There wasn't anything like particularly amazing about this, this person to look at, and so most missed it. Most were distracted by their own thoughts and expectations. And what, but, you know, and then this, this servant, they just described as a servant who ended up being beaten and he was tried falsely and he, and he died. But then he came back to life. And, and was, there, was there a moment in there where, when I was reading that where you didn't know who that was talking about? I mean, who was I talking about when I read that? It was Jesus, of course, it's Jesus. But what's interesting about this is that the man who wrote this had never, he'd never actually heard of Jesus. He had never met Jesus. He had never met anyone who knew Jesus. He had never heard the name of Jesus. Do you know why that is? Because he wrote those words 700 years before Jesus walked the earth. Isn't that weird? It's Isaiah 53, the first 10 verses there. I mean, these were things that, that the people of Israel had. They had words, they had descriptions, they had prophecies from people like Isaiah, but also a whole bunch of other prophets, literally for hundreds and hundreds of years, that would talk about this Messiah, this Savior that was going to come and save Israel, and they believed it, they had hope, it's what they, they knew, they studied it, they poured over these these prophecies, and they knew what was to come, and they thought that they knew why he was going to show up. The problem was, is that by the time the first century rolled around and Jesus began to walk the earth, most people missed it. They missed him altogether. They missed it because their expectations superseded the reality of what they were experiencing because they thought they knew. There's, there's still Jews today that believe that Jesus, of course, is not the Messiah and that they're still waiting on him to show up and they have their reasons. 
But I, I would just venture to say that, um, that while that's what happened in the first century and that a lot of people missed it, you know, even though they had all the signs and all the, you know, the, the, the ideas and the thoughts and they had scripture, even though um, that was what was happening then, I think it still happens today. I think there's plenty of us, maybe there's some of you in this room and you would, you would categorize yourself that way. It's like, I, I'm just here. It's Easter. This is kind of a tradition. This is what I do. I go with my family. I go with my wife. I go with my husband. I go with my mom. You know, I'm in town, and so this is what they're doing. So this is what I have to do. Maybe somebody's forcing you to watch this online later. Whatever the case may be, that may be you, but you might find yourself in, you, you would kind of categorize yourself as maybe a doubter or a skeptic or just an unbeliever, a non Christian that's sitting. You know, this isn't my jam. You know, I just don't understand all of this or it's kind of weird that y'all do. And the thing is, I think many of us still miss Jesus today, but I think it's more often than not for all the wrong reasons. You see, the people in the first century, those Jews in the first century, they didn't miss Jesus because they lacked information or because they didn't know the scriptures. They had the information, they had heard the stories and they knew what they were waiting on, they thought. That's not why they missed it. They misunderstood why the Messiah, the Messiah would come in the first place. That's what they missed. And because Jesus was not meeting those expectations and their assumptions about what he was there to do, they missed Jesus altogether. And I think that's what happens to a lot of us sometimes. We, just, we get caught up... Um, in the things that distract us, you know, so maybe your story is, and, and I've talked to a lot of, I love talking about this because I, I don't know what it is. I, I love people that aren't just there to argue. They just, they just have a story and it makes sense. And, and probably if I heard your story of why you're kind of an mm, unbeliever, disbeliever, irreligious, I would probably go, oh, well, I get it. I understand. And so I want you to know that today. Like that's okay to, to, to find yourself there today. But I, I think it's entirely possible, and I want, like, it, is it, I just want you to ask yourself this anyway, ask yourself, is it possible, is it within the realm of possibility that maybe you didn't walk away from Jesus, that you walked away from religion? Because there's so many people that I think walk away for things that have nothing to do with Christianity or what it means to follow Jesus. You know, there's some church hurt. There's something that happened in the past. There's, you know, well, it's that church or those people, and it was a Christian or a group of Christians or people who said that, or, or you just look at people from the outside looking, and it's like, y'all are just a bunch of hypocrites. And, and whatever your reason is, I probably would go, I, I totally get it. I understand. But I don't want you to walk away having walked away from something you don't have to walk away from. I want to make sure in, in the time that I have today that you at least know what you're walking away from. That this isn't just, you know, something to pass the time or something weird people do, okay? I don't know, maybe I'm weird. It is weird. It's weird to believe what we believe, but, but there's reason. Like, I, I mean, I, and I've thought about it. The entirety of my 49 years, it's like I've considered, you know, what, like, what do I believe? Like, I mean, in seminary, I was asking questions like this. I mean, I was at preacher school, and yet I'm, I'm asking, like, why, am, why do I think I'm right? Like, what, what is this? I want to get my questions answered. I want to feel this. I want to figure it all out. And, but I want to get to the root of this today, and I want you to walk away knowing what you're walking away from, Okay? Because it's not religion, it's not a church, it's not church people, it's not uh, hypocritical Christians. All that's yucky, and I get it, and I don't like it either, to be real honest with you. But I want you to know what you're actually leaving behind if you end up missing Jesus, okay? You see, this is what it boils down to. As Christians, as believers, as a third of the world's population on this day is celebrating something, you know what we're not doing? We're not celebrating a holiday. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, period. That's it. 
We're not celebrating the teachings of Jesus. We're not celebrating the miracles of Jesus. We're not even celebrating the life that Jesus lived. You know what we're celebrating? Because all that's good stuff. But had he not been seen alive after being put to death, then we wouldn't be celebrating anything. And you may you know, not have a problem so much with you know, the teachings of Jesus, and he seemed like a good guy, and maybe he really was a real historical figure, and like, you're okay with that, but it's, you know, and maybe even his life is kind of worth emulating, because he's like, he's like, you know, there was some good stuff there. Maybe that's kind of where you've ended, but then it's like, when you bump into like, oh, he, dead man came back to life, eh, no, I don't know about that. Maybe that's the hang up, and guess what? You're in good company, you have reason to be skeptical, and it's okay. We should all be a little bit. Like, we should wonder, because that's not, here, you ready for this? It's not easy to believe, but it's not unbelievable. It's not easy to believe, but it's not unbelievable, and there's reason for that. And so with the time that I have, I want to share some things with you. I want to give you some reasons to consider or at least to reconsider so that you know that you're walking away from Jesus without missing Jesus. I don't want anything to distract from this. And so um, maybe you grew up and, you know, you, you did some... Anybody do vacation Bible school when you were young, when you were little? Like, even if you're not a believer, it's like, is anybody willing to admit that? Vacation Bible school, and back when I was young, it was like felt board stories, you know, and you had little figures, and they would tell the student it was great. Like, I loved all that. You'd memorize some verses and... And nowadays, it's like, you know, parents schedule their summer based on all the churches in the area and when they're, you know, because it's like free, you know, babysitting. It's like, I'll send them to all the VBSs nowadays. It's like, no matter how, when, when's the next one? Oh, that one overlaps a little bit, but it's okay. I'll just throw them in there. Oh, they're doing the exact same thing that that other church did? Oh, too bad. <laughs> you're going back, like you're getting, you're going to get some more of that. That's what we do, and that's okay, like, but, but we get the stories, and especially if you grew up in the South or in church or whatever it was, you, you've got some idea, and maybe you remember even this part of the story as well, that that Friday, it was a dark Friday. What we celebrate is Good Friday now. It wasn't so good then. It didn't feel that great, and Jesus at this point, late in the afternoon, he had, he had been arrested and given a false trial. He didn't say a lot. And then he was beaten and he was put on a Roman cross, condemned to death, and he died. And in fact, they kind of had to speed things up a little bit because it was near, the Jews were thinking, you know, like, what's about to happen? Well, this was Passover week for them. This was a huge celebration. Jesus had even shared the, that last Passover meal with them the night before, the night he got arrested. Well, now he's, he's dead, and he's on the cross, and Passover actually starts in the evening of Friday and carries on till the evening of Saturday. And so they had to get things prepared quickly. And so a couple of Sadducees, which was just a, like a religious sect, an arm, like the Pharisees, and there were Sadducees, and a couple of them went in and, and took the body of Jesus down off the cross, and they, you know, a couple of guys prepared things and got things ready um, as quickly as they could because, I mean, this was right on the cusp of Passover, and they couldn't do any work. They couldn't do this kind of thing, so they had to get him in a tomb nearby as quickly as possible. Well, then it was, you know, about 24 hours later, after the Passover had passed and the Sabbath had passed, and now it's the evening, that's Saturday evening, and so I was thinking about this yesterday, you know, I was like, so it's like Saturday evening, and this is kind of, this was dark for followers of Jesus, you know? Like, this was not, I just can't imagine. And the thing is, Jesus, um, at the time he got arrested, everybody walked away and abandoned him. Now, this is interesting, because if you've ever doubted, if you've ever had disbelief, well, guess what? We're 2,000 years removed. I get that. These were people who spent three and a half years with Jesus, watched all the things he, he had, was capable of doing, heard the things that he, had, that he had taught, and it was unbelievable. He taught with so much authority. He did incredible things. He even raised people back to life. He did that on a couple of different occasions. They had witnessed all of these things. And yet, 
Even though Jesus had predicted that he was going to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders of Jerusalem, even though he had predicted it, when he got arrested, they went into hiding real fast. They abandoned him. They left. Why? Because they were nervous that what happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. I mean, sure. The very people who would end up later writing about the story and the life and the death of Jesus wrote themselves into the story as skeptics. Having all the information, knowing all the scriptures, and yet missing Jesus. And they knew who he was, or at least who they thought he was, but they missed the why, even at this point. We've stressed that over the last few weeks in Luke's gospel, because I think he just, it's like he's beating that dead horse a little bit. He's like, they missed it. The reason they missed it is because they didn't understand why he was really there. They didn't get it, even though Jesus would explain it over and over. And so now here they are, you know, and Jesus has been dead since the previous evening. And now as, you know, Sabbath has, has passed, that night some of the women had prepared, some of his followers had prepared more spices and gotten things ready to go finish what the guys didn't do real well the night before. And so they had decided, we're going to put this stuff together, and then tomorrow morning, before, it's, before dawn, we're going to go and properly embalm the body of Jesus, if you will. And yet, they showed up the next morning. It's still dark. And they find that the guards who had been, placed, who had been stationed there, they were gone. The big stone that had been protecting that tomb was pushed aside, and there was no, no body in the grave. And, of course, their first thought was, well, what happened? Their first thought wasn't, oh, he is alive. Who does that? Because they thought that dead people just do what dead people do, which is stay dead. So they assumed that that would happen with Jesus. This certainly couldn't be how it was going to, this couldn't have been the plan. And so they're wondering what happened. Well, then they, to, you know, this was their story. A couple of angels, a couple of men with glowing, you know, bodies and clothing, like showed up and said, what are you doing looking for the living among the dead? What are you doing here? He's, he's alive. He's, don't you remember, he said he was going to be crucified and that he was going to die, but then he was going to come back to life. And guess what he did? He's alive. And so you have nothing to fear. And of course, they're still skeptical and wondering, but they're also kind of ooh, excited and like, maybe we should go tell everybody, you know. And they go running back. And this is like during the time. This isn't hundreds of years later. This is like, like a couple of days later. And now they're running back and they want to go into the city and find where all the other disciples are all huddled up together in hiding. And they tell them what happened. And listen to the response. Like you don't... You don't write a story like this and write yourself into the story as the dummy. And yet, here's naturally, they didn't believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Ah, of course. Some of you are here today because, and, and you're doubting and you have disbelief and you're skeptical and this is the only time you show up for whatever reason, and it's because it, the words just seem like nonsense to you. And it does. I mean, if we wanted you to come along and, like, do our thing, like, why would we make up something this hard to believe? I mean, this is not the way you get people to follow along with your deal, is give them something so hard to believe that they would rather walk away. And yet, it feels like, it seems like nonsense, and yet, maybe the reality is, is true. But this, is, this was the position of Jesus' closest followers. And yet Peter decides he's going to go on ahead like, and see for himself because that's who he was. He's a man of action. Peter, however, got up, ran to the tomb, bending over, he goes into the tomb, he sees the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. He didn't walk away going, Jesus is alive! He's alive! Oh my goodness, it actually happened. I can't believe it. He's alive. He walked away going, hmm. What in the world? Jesus talked something about this, but I wonder what where's it, where did they take his body? It was either 
It wasn't that he was resurrected. That wasn't the first thought. It was that he was, you know, either taken and moved or just stolen by somebody. I mean, this was, this was even darker than before. Like, this was not what they wanted to hear. Jesus' closest followers had trouble believing. So, of course, we're going to, like, let me, let me just validate some of your disbelief. It's okay. If you're not asking questions, start asking questions. But look for honest answers. That's what I want, I want to encourage people to do, always. Like, if I sit down with somebody and, and this is kind of their story, I just want, like, I, I, want to, I want them to know, look, I get it. I get it. I'm, I'm with you. But you don't, if your goal is to get all of your questions answered and your doubts satisfied in order to put your faith in Jesus, you'll never put your faith in Jesus, period. Do you think that they understood everything? Well, how did this happen? Let me pull out my science books. Let me try to figure out how this happened. No, they didn't understand they still didn't have it all figured out. In fact, it was several weeks later before they really got going on this message, you know, and they had seen him alive. But at this point, they're just, they're just uncertain. Now, here's, here's a story that Luke records <clears throat> that aren't in the other Gospels. Um, <clears throat> and some would call it uh, now the walk to Emmaus, and there's some, you know, things that you can go to that are called that, and it's just... Um, it's, it's this stirring that happens in a couple of Jesus followers that, that happened like that day, like that afternoon, that Sunday. You know, they, they found that the body's not there and, you know, nobody knows what's going on. And these women say that, you know, hey, you know, it was, he's back to life. And yet, oh, that's hard to believe. And so now, I mean, Passover is over. Sabbath is over. <clears throat> They're on their way home. They're on their way back to Emmaus that same day, Sunday afternoon. Two of them, them being followers of Jesus, were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that happened. And here's what Luke records that these guys later shared. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Why do you think that is? Why would you believe that? It's either not him or I'm absolutely hallucinating. Was there something in that water? Because surely it's not Jesus. He's dead. This is literally on the heels of when they had watched everything happen. And they're leaving Jerusalem and they're on their way back home. And it's like, of course. This isn't Jesus, and, and yet Jesus speaks to them. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. And I love this response, the way that Luke records it anyway. And I think he was a little, little, little tongue-in-cheek here. Listen to their response to Jesus' question. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one? Visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Okay, today's vernacular, are you crazy? Have you been asleep for the last three days? Do you not? Know? How is it you must be the only guy walking out of Jerusalem who was here this weekend who doesn't know what's going on? Are you kidding me? That's my version of it. But that's kind of what he's saying. How do you not know? And so then they, they go on to tell him. It's like, oh, you don't know clearly. And so let me tell you. And so then Cleopas here and his buddy begin to tell Jesus about Jesus. What things, Jesus asked? Well, about Jesus of Nazareth. You know, what, what have I missed? Well, Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. He was amazing. He was this rabbi. He taught unbelievable things. Walked on water. And then the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped 
that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We believed it before he died. Now we don't. Why? Because we watched him die. And they beat him bad. Like, they killed him good. Like, there was no... And they said, it's... What is more, what, what gives it even more validity in their mind, it, it is the third day since all of this took place. In their mind, as that time passes, his soul has even left his body. That's why it was important when Lazarus, if you remember that story in John, John's Gospel... When Lazarus, it was four days after he had been, after he had passed, that he showed back up because for them, they believed that it took some time before their soul left their body. And so, you know, if it was only a day or so, well, he was only kind of dead. Maybe nobody will believe it. So there was something to this. Like enough time has passed now, it's certain. He's dead, and yet now his body's not there. And this is what they say. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, like that day, but didn't find his body. They expected to find his body, in other words. Like, let's fill in the gaps here. They expected to find his body. Why? Because he was dead, and dead people stay dead. Why would this one be any different? They came along and told us that they had seen a vision of angels, though, who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. Let me back up one. They didn't find his body. They didn't see Jesus. The women didn't find his body, and they were expecting a body. That meant something. The other disciples ran to the tomb. They didn't see Jesus, and they expected to see Jesus. Why? Because he was dead. The people who were close, like, (laughs) if if you're a Christian in here, and you've ever been bothered because somebody has argued with you or had some doubts or had questions about faith and things that you hold dear, what? What do you expect? You think that's easy to just... All of a sudden, especially as really smart, you know, adults like we all are, to get to a point in our lives where we go, okay, so we're going like 2,000 years, long time, not a lot of history. Let's see, um, carpenter, dead, rose from the grave, and he's God. Uh, That one's hard. Does anybody not, like, that's a tough one. There's some other things that are much less difficult to believe that I struggle to believe, you know. But this is a tough one for people. Give them a break. Even Jesus' closest followers thought he would still be dead. And listen to Jesus' response. And I don't think it's as harsh as the way this sounds. How foolish you are. But here's what he means. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did, you, did not the Messiah, watch what he says, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? In other words, guys, you're devout Jews. You know the scriptures. You've got the information. Matter of fact, you've had it for centuries. You've been studying this stuff and memorizing this stuff and you know, believing this stuff for a long, long time. And you knew. Don't you know it had to happen this way? I mean, have you read Isaiah 53 like we just did a minute ago? And it talks about him suffering, being rejected, being a nobody, discounted. People turned their head. They didn't give him the time of day. And then he was killed. Like, you know this. And then Luke tells us that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. It's like, I know you've heard all this before, but it's kind of like you've missed it. And so let me give you a fresh look. And as they're walking and finishing their, their journey to Emmaus, they're discussing these things and talking about it. Who knew? It could have taken a couple of days to travel that far. Maybe they got there in a day, but they, they had time. And Jesus talking their ear off, and then they get there, and 
Looks like Jesus is about to leave as, as they approach the village to which they were going. So Jesus has given this, all this information. He continued on as if he were going farther, as if he was just going to leave them. And they're like, no, they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. And so he went to stay with them. It's like, don't leave, don't leave. Just hang out for a little bit longer. They still don't know who he is at this point. But when he was at the table with them, when they were about to have a meal, Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he began to give it to them. And in that moment, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Those are the only two witnesses of this one. You know what I'm saying? There's only two. And they tell this story this way. Why would you tell a story this way if you want somebody to believe you? Yeah, dude, Jesus, I know he died a few days ago, but I'm telling you, like, he showed up, and he hung out with us for a little while, and he told us all kinds of stuff. And then as he began to break that bread, it was like, oh, my goodness, the light bulb came on, and it was him, and I just know it. And then he disappeared. And surely everybody was like, I'm, what? What? What do you mean he disappeared? Like poof? Like did it make a noise? Like did, his, did he leave his clothes there? Like did the clothes disappear too? Like how does this work? What do you mean you saw Jesus? But he hadn't disappeared before. How does this work? And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Cleopas wasn't it like our hearts were on fire somehow? Like, like almost like we knew, but we didn't know. As he was revealing, it's like, oh my goodness, something is stirring in me. And I just feel it. it have you ever felt that before? Like maybe it's <clears throat> in a service like this, or <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever driven down the road and you're listening to some worship music and you just have that moment. It doesn't always happen. Most of the time you're you know, ticked off at the people who are cutting you off around you. But sometimes it's like, you just have that, that moment, you know? And it's like, oh, he's right there with me. I sense that. I mean, that was something like this. It's like, I don't know. Like, I just knew it, but I didn't know it. And I certainly didn't want to say it. And something happened. Like, our hearts were burning. And it's like we knew. He revealed <clears throat> what we already knew. We had the information. We had the scriptures. We have poured over them for hundreds of years. We missed it, though. But now I get it. And this is what I want you to, to consider today. I want to give you a couple of thoughts. Things that I think are worth reconsidering if you find yourself in that category of no way. And I get that. But it's worth at least considering that you're in good company because those who were closest to Jesus, it's worth considering, wrote themselves into the story as skeptics as well, as doubters, as unbelievers who then later gave their life for the very story they had trouble believing. Who does that? And so if you find yourself, maybe, maybe this is your category. I just think I have too many doubts and questions and too much disbelief, too much concern. I just know too much. I'm too smart. I'm too logical. I've never experienced this in this world. And so I don't have a category for dude comes back to life. And yet here is the truth. You do not, please walk away believing this. You do not have to have all of your questions answered in order to follow Jesus. <clears throat> in fact, you'll never have them all answered. Every Christian who has ever lived has had doubts and questions. If you think you don't, you're not being intellectually honest with yourself. There's always doubts and questions. There's always things to be answered. But that's not what ultimately matters. What really matters is, was this guy Jesus really who he said he was? That's what really matters. You know what 
what is great to talk about, but what will debate and, and what has been debated, for example, for the last 2,000 years, and people still do, and they argue, and everybody thinks they're right, and this and that, was, was the creation account recorded in Genesis, was it actually seven days, or was it something different? Guess what? I'm not real sure. I wasn't there. I have my ideas. I have my thoughts. But nobody on this planet is going to convince you that it's one way or the other. And there's lots of reasons on both sides of that equation. Lots. I promise you. Think, I mean, just spend some time doing some research. There's like, you, if you're waiting to have that one nailed down, you'll never follow Jesus. And there's a million others just like that. So what does it really boil down to? Who is Jesus? Because if you can get that question answered for yourself, the rest become less essential. They matter. I love to debate. I love to talk about them. I love to teach about them and to give you thoughts. And, but you don't have to have it figured out or you don't have to have it make complete sense in your finite mind in order to begin believing. You can begin following Jesus. You can put faith in Jesus. Matter of fact, that's what faith is. Faith is choosing to place yourself in someone or something else's hands without having all the knowledge and all the understanding. You've got experience. I talked with, you know, with our um, small group. We meet really early on Thursday mornings. It's a little painful. But I love our discussions. It's, it becomes worth it once I get there. Amen? <laughs> 5 a.m. is really early for me. I know. Some of you, it's like, <sighs> I'm not a morning person. I apologize. But just this past week, we ended up talking about this. And this is one of the things that we all run into. It, it's like we, we think that in order to be intellectually honest with ourselves, that we've got to get all questions answered and doubts eliminated. But that's just not what it means to follow. And so when we sit down around that table, we go to Jack's, you know, and we sit down and we pull out that chair. Not one of us who sat down that day went, hold on a second, let me study the chair. I need to make sure that it is sound and secure. It's made of metal, but these look like weak joints. I don't know that I'm going to sit there. When's the last time you did that? You sat down in these chairs and you didn't ask anybody, are these chairs safe? You exercised faith to sit in that chair. It could have crashed beneath you because maybe it had a crack in it or something had happened to it and you didn't know it, and bam, and then you sue Ridge Church and, you know, we're not meeting anymore. <laughs> you do you see what I'm saying? You exercise faith. You exercise faith every time you get on the road and you're driving and you're, you have faith that those cars aren't going to literally just jackknife into you or pull into you. What happens, though, when you've been in three or four wrecks? Now you're a little more cautious. What if every week since the moment you've attended Ridge Church, you fell out of your chair because it cracked? Well, either would stop coming or you're going to check every chair or you're going to start sitting on the side. Or the, like, it takes faith. And sometimes our experience tells us otherwise, and yet it still takes faith. You don't have to have all of your questions answered. And then maybe you just think, well, I'm just not good enough to be a Christian. You don't know my story. Okay, pastor, great faith, Jesus, he's alive, woohoo! But I don't think this is for me. I'm not good enough. And let me just, answer, let me just resolve that. For, I want you to walk away. This is what Scripture teaches. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive, period. Following him will make your life better. It will make you better at life, but it's not why he came. He came to give you life. And not just, you know, because maybe the hang-up for you, it's like, well, I just don't know, because like, 
uh, you know, that's one day and that's, the, that's not the here and now and that's eternal. What's eternity? What, what does it mean to be timeless? You know, I don't understand all of that. And it's so far in the future. And like, what about now? And that's what we're all concerned with is like today and now. And yet the truth is he didn't just come to offer you life later. He came to offer you life like now. And in every area of your life, there are a lot of Christians <clears throat> who follow Jesus all their life, and yet they live like they're dead, powerless. Well, so it's like they're saying, and this may be some of the hang-up for some of you, because you look at them, it's like, what's the difference? Like, that doesn't look fun, because they live all hung up, and like, you know, I'm still addicted, you know, oh, yes, I believe in Jesus, and he died for my sins, but, you know, life is still kind of miserable, and it's sorry, and it's yucky, and I'm still addicted, and I'm still you know, and broken marriages and broken relationships and, you know, no money and financial insecurity. And it's like all of these things. And it's like <laughs> Jesus didn't just come so that, hey, later life looks really good for you when you die. He gives, he breathes life into every area of your life. And to live otherwise is to not really believe that. And I want you to walk away different. And here's the thing, it just, it, it, it does begin with a step of faith. That is where it starts. That is what initiates a relationship because a step of faith is to say, I am dependent on somebody outside of myself. And I believe it's Jesus. Jesus didn't die just so that you could have life later. He died so that you could have life right now. So here's what I'm going to I'm just going to extend an invitation because that's all I can do. You know, I'm, I'm powerless to do anything. This is all something that has to happen as a result of the Holy Spirit working in you and your willingness to respond to it. I can't make either of those things happen. All I can do is present a moment and extend an invitation. In fact, that's what Jesus did. I stand at the door and knock. Those who let me in, I will come in and I will sup with them. I will dine with them. Like, me with them, they with me. Like, it's an invitation. It's not a crashing down of the doors. And so that's all I'm doing. I'm not asking you to get rid of all of your questions and doubts. In fact, I love talking about those things. But look for honest answers. But you can do all of that in a faith relationship with Jesus. So here's what I want to invite you to do. If you'll get out your phone again, if you would, if you'll just humor me, if you'll take out that phone and open it back up. Now, we're going to put the QR code back on the screen in case you, you missed it or in case Ryan didn't get our website fixed or something. But if it's not working, again, go to a browser, ridgechurch.com slash Easter slash survey. It'll take you to the same spot. You can do the same thing at home. And maybe you've answered those first couple of questions. But, but now I, wanna, I want you to answer the last question. I'm going to give you, you know, 30, 45 seconds to consider that. Got a little music playing in the background. And, and we're going to end the service here in just a second. We're going to sing a song. We're going to worship one more time together as a response. But before we do that, as, as quietly and as reverently as you can, if you would just consider that last question. And everybody in here should be able to mark one of those. Like, I am in a growing relationship with Jesus. Bam. I want to know that. This, how you respond will help me know how to pray for you. That's it. And our, our prayer team people. But it's, it's, this is not, I'm not, I promise. This isn't because I'm going to, well, later, this is my sneaky way of, you know, getting you to give me a lot of money, okay? That's, you are at the, <laughs> there's a reason we're still in the high school after ten and a half years, okay? That is not what we're doing here, okay? Please do that. Maybe it's, I know I need to begin following Jesus and I commit my life to him. I'm taking that step of faith. Maybe that's your answer. Maybe it's, I just need to recommit my life. Today is that day. Or maybe it's, this is a decision I'll never make. I just don't see myself ever doing that. That's okay. 
It just lets me know where you are right now. And I'm just telling you, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm not going to hunt you down. Promise. Please trust me on that. I'm not going to do that. I just want to be praying for you. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds if you'll answer that question. And when you're done, if you'll just bow your heads quietly right where you are, that'll let me know kind of where everybody is. And then we're going to close with a song. So if you would do that. So with your heads bowed, eyes closed, you know the church drill. It's an important moment, though. This is not a, you know, just another service. If, it, if you're making a decision to place faith in Jesus today, this is a life-altering, eternity-changing moment for you or for somebody right around you. But if you're, if you're that person who wants to take the step of faith, to bend to follow Jesus for the first time, I'm going to invite you right where you are to just pray with me silently. This again, this isn't about an awkward moment. We're not going to, not going to get you to raise your hand or to walk away. I just want to invite you to pray something like this with me. As a declaration of dependence on Jesus, that's what this is. So just right where you are, if you're at home or in the room, and this is the decision that you are making, would you pray something like this? Heavenly Father, I want to put my trust in you. I know I need to. I've got so many questions. I've got some doubts and some hang-ups when it comes to church and church people. But I know now that that's not what matters. And I don't want to walk away from you and the gift that you have offered to me any longer. So I confess that I'm a sinner and that I'm dead without you. I need a Savior. And I believe that he is Jesus, the Son of God. I receive your invitation. I'm placing my faith in you. And I ask that you fill me now with your spirit. And give me a confidence in who you are, not who I am. And that my identity now is found in Jesus Christ and him alone. God, I want to live for you all of my days through the power of your spirit within me. Thank you for life. And I pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.